Good afternoon, everybody. It's about half past one UK time here. I've been awake for a few hours now, and uh, to be honest, since about ten o'clock last night, it's been a. I've had a sort of dull, sick feeling in my stomach, and it's one I've never really experienced before. I've never experienced in the raw a motor racing death. It is something none of us as fans wants to ever have to experience. I came to the NASCAR scene about a year after the death of Dale Earnhardt. I missed that. I missed any of the deaths before. Paul Dana, I only read about in a magazine. But last night I got some rather pff, horrific images that like the screen burn when you leave a TV on for ages paused and you get the same thing stuck on the screen like a screen burn that's basically what's happened here you know what I'm talking about and if you don't you can basically take to Twitter to YouTube to anything to find out what this is I'm talking about the sad demise the loss of one of the most underappreciated British drivers of the last decade, Mr. Dan Weldon. But actually, me talking about that as a underappreciated British driver, it seems to miss the point somewhat, because we're not just talking about a driver here, we're talking about a family man, a parent, a friend to so many. Now that's something I'll get onto in a little bit. Basically, <clears throat> in a nutshell, last night, as I said, you can found you can find this footage wherever you look now on YouTube or anything. It was the Las Vegas Indy 300, the final round um, of a season that's been riddled with controversy and drama and other such things. There was a title fight on the line, and there was a prize fund of five million dollars for a non-regular driver to win the race. The one guy to accept the challenge was Dan Weldon. And he talked effusely before the race about how he was looking forward to the challenge. How he just signed, or was going to sign, a deal for a full-time ride next year. This was a man who came off winning the Indy 500 this year in one of the big upset victories that the Indy 500, that American Motorsport has known. And then all of a sudden, 12 laps in, absolute carnage erupts. Now, IndyCar Rex looks spectacular and pretty horrifying as it is. But when there's 15 of them piling up into the wall, there's cars on fire, there's bits of flaming car all over the track, you know you are dealing with something serious. And what really frightened me, because I came in just after the accident, I heard something about there was being a big crash, so I joined the coverage just after it. They then put a cover over Dan Wel the remnants of Weldon's car. And the marshals looked very worried. And for about an hour and a half, there was a horrible silence. Not on the airwaves, obviously they kept commentating in that. But there was just a horrible lack of updates. Oh, he's alright, he's, he's, he's been released from the infield care centre. Oh no, he's alright, he's up, he's up and speaking. There wasn't anything. And for some reason I knew, and I don't think I would be the only one, that something was badly wrong. And then came a really... This is where the sick feeling really started. When Randy Bernhardt turned up in the press conference and started using... He, they, ES, um, Speed, I think it was, who were covering it. Or ESP, whoever it was, missed the first half of that. And all it heard was, our thoughts and prayers are with his family. Which is speak for, he's fucking copped it. And Marty Reed basically said the same thing with a very heavy tone of voice just a few moments later. And since then I've been feeling very, very weird. Drained. It's the weirdest feeling. I, I'm i not a huge one for the indie cars. I watch it sporadically. I've, I've kept notes on Dan Weldon's career, which has been an excellent career. But it's still... You can barely find the words to actually put it together, to actually express it. If we look at his, if we'll pay tribute 
first to his career because it was a very very good career he came up through the ranks over here in the UK born originally in Buckinghamshire um, and he won lots of national championships here could have perhaps gone to Formula 1 but in 1999 he went to pursue a dream sorry if I keep adjusting the microphone here he went to pursue a dream in America he went after the Indy cars and he moved up through the ranks there and I still remember his 2005 season I remember because it was in the Autosport sport magazines we get here they were covering it every week and there was a huge celebration when he won the Indy 500 and he won the title wow this is amazing stuff he was at the top of the world then since then he's had sort of sporadic success but he's always been a very good driver I don't think that's ever been called into question I mean he wa he came runner up at the 500 like two or three times in succession it was ridiculous and then this year he obviously got the lucky break at the sad expense of J.R. Hildebrand and got a second 500 and that brings me on to the, perhaps the more sad the sadder part of this in that some of the photos in there just in lieu of what's happened almost push you to tears some of them because there's shots of him with the the trophy the brickyard trophy kissing the bricks and he's there with a lovely wife and two very young children one of them was apparently only a couple of months old at the time of the 500 she would be n nine months old now which brings it more into sharp focus that as much as we put these people on pedestals and celebrate them and worship them and slate them and slag them off and criticize and throw rocks at them or throw flowers at them when they do well they're not superheroes they're regular humans like you and I and they have to lead regular lives like you and I and perhaps that's the worst bit because Mr. Weldon not only garnered attention through what he did on the track but what he did off it and that's what really strikes me about this nobody has really had a bad word to say about him well of course no one would really dare say that unless they're a total ignorant fucking prick just after someone died still hasn't stopped some people on YouTube though but hey but it just strikes me of how many friends he seemed to have in the motorsport community and beyond so many people are telling stories of how they bumped into him somewhere or they got his autograph and how nice he was how much of a good guy he was he really was one of the good guys there are friends in Formula 1 there are, he has friends in Formula 1 Lewis Hamilton, Jensen Button, Mark Webber Rubens Barrichello, four or five drivers have already tweeted this morning about how they remember racing with him at some level most of them in Britain coming up through the ranks there there are people in obviously in the V8 supercars in Australia where he was due to run as a guest driver alongside the current champion James Courtney Courtney was a good friend of his as was a few other drivers as were many other drivers there were plenty of fans really looking forward to seeing him down there he had fans he had people who loved him all over America most of the world really and I've always said he's been very underappreciated in, in my home country, in the UK. I've always thought he's been very underappreciated in that respect. But I'm happy to say, in one respect, I have been proven wrong in that. Because a lot of people have paid tribute to him today. Just so many of them. I mean, Twitter has just been rife, flooded with it. You know, you can't move for it. And rightly so. Rightly so. You... Guy was one of the good guys. I, I keep saying it. But in a way that shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter if he's one of the good guys. It, it doesn't matter because it all comes down to the question of he did die in the end doing something he loved. But should people deserve to die doing the things that they love? Perhaps. I don't know that question. The answer to that that's perhaps something for another day I mean I think it's right that a lot of people haven't started pointing fingers at IndyCar at the track people saying there were safety concerns about the racing fast and that but it's we have to we, it's, it's wrong 
to point fingers right now. I don't think Mr. Weldon would want that. Because at the end of the day, if he expressed a concern, he still raced. And that's the thing. I think it was Oriol Servia who said about something else. He said, as motor racing drivers, if you give us a limit to push, we will push that limit. If somebody says, oh, that's not hugely safe, but you're still going to do it, you're not going to do it at half speed. You're not going to back off. Whether that's whether you think that's brave, heroic, stupid, pig-headed, it ultimately doesn't really matter. This is motor racing. It's entertainment. It is glorious. It has the ability to unite us, as this has in a sad way. It has the ability to unite us. It has the ability to give us the, the highest highs and the lowest lows. When a driver steps out of his car while having won the Indy 500, or the Daytona 500, or the Le Mans 24 Hours, or the Bathurst 1000, or the Monaco Grand Prix. That is the summit. That is, for them, the very highest they can achieve. They, th This is the glorious mountain of which they have climbed to the summit of. But at the same time, moments like this show you that not everyone does make it to the top. And some of them are cruelly cut short on their way to the top. And I'll leave it up to you to decide about he died doing something he loved. We know the risks. Of course he did. We, we all do as motor, they all do as motor racing drivers. But I guess what's called into focus here is just how, I mean, in the 50s and 60s or before then, it was a fairly good bet that most drivers wouldn't make it out of wrecks. In in cars that <laughs> the safety conditions were appalling, and safety at the end of the day, NASCAR fans may moan about the car of tomorrow. But if it has improved safety, then it's ultimately been worth it, in a way. We cannot sanitize motor racing completely. So they're racing around in foam padding covered bubble cars with a top speed of 30 miles an hour. But if we can make so that a driver doesn't have to fear as much losing his life doing what he loves. Then I think that's a no brainer. But and perhaps that's the most ironic thing. Because Mr. Weldon had been involved most of this year without a full-time ride testing next year's IndyCar, the new chassis. Ironically, its biggest feature was new safety. That it wouldn't take off as easily. That the wheels wouldn't clip other wheels and send it flying into the air as easily. These are all things that happened in that accident. If you want to go look at it, I warn you, it's horrible. Go and, look, go and find it on YouTube if you really want to. I've watched it more times than I really want to. It's some sort of morbid fascination, I think, in human in the human condition, I think. But perhaps that's a huge irony to this. I don't know. Maybe I'm now spouting crap. Existentialist crap. You know? Because, really, my point on the safety thing is that over the last few years, we have seen so many huge accidents... Just the last week at Bathurst, there was a guy whose car was trashed and it was covered in fuel and it set on fire and he got out. He escaped, he was fine. Jimmy Johnson slams into a wall head first at like 150 miles an hour. He's fine. Shaken up, but he's okay. There are so many... We've come accustomed to seeing huge accidents and breathing a sigh of relief when they get out the other side. What seemed so scary about yesterday was that he didn't walk away. He wasn't even moving. There was no, he's been checked and released from the infield care centre. There wasn't anything. There was a horrible silence. And then a cold realisation. He wasn't coming back. And I think the salute they did was very touching. Some of those drivers, that was the last thing they probably wanted to do. They probably just wanted to go home. Dario Franchitti, as much as I've slagged him off before, I mean, you couldn't help but be moved. He was crying his eyes out in the car. Tony Kanaan was sobbing. He's announced today that he's pulling out of the V8 Supercar event. I don't blame him. He apologised about it on Twitter. I, I sent him a message straight away. I said, 
you have nothing to apologise for. A friend of yours in your native sport has died doing what he's loved. If you if you don't feel anything about that, then you are some sort of fucking robot. At the end. But my overall point is that I think it's wrong of us to point fingers right now. That's for another day. The post mortem, the inquest, is for another day. For now, I really want to invite all of you listening to this to celebrate the career, the tragically short career. 33 is no fucking age to die. He could have lasted 20, 30 more years and it still would have been too early for him to die. But the short career that took him to the very top and looked like it may well have taken him back to the very top. But alas, we'll never know. It's a celebration of a career of a great racing driver but also the life of a brilliant bloke. And as I said at the top of this podcast, they're humans. They have wives, they have parents, they have family, they have friends, some of them have kids. They have a job, which at the end of the day is what they love. Motor racing. They are normal blokes. They aren't supermen. And I think yesterday we had a stark reminder of that. That every once in a while somebody doesn't get lucky, doesn't just walk away. And that it still occurs. So rest in peace, Mr. Weldon. You will be greatly missed. And I want to echo Marty Reed's excellent send-off line yesterday. At the end of the commentary, he said, People always ask me why I sign off of the line till we meet again. It's because goodbye is always so final. Goodbye, Dan Weldon. <laughs>